Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spore the Warning podcast. This is review number 736 with a review of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I'm Christopher Stacey. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spore the Warning podcast is a weekly film review program. <laughs> weekly, W-E-A-K-L-Y, weekly <laughs> film review program. <laughs> Uh, but uh, each week of the show, we're going to dive in, debate, and discuss uh, the latest films coming to a theater near you, um, or the closest latest film coming to a theater near you. You know, uh, lately, uh, it w- wasn't the most recent film, but uh, now it is. We're, we're, we're back. Steven's yeah. back. Uh, we're actually recording the weekend that a film came out, and hopefully you will get this episode sometime this week and you'll be listening to it and it'll feel like a fresh return to the podcast uh, because steven's back and he's freshly returned uh from a little festival across the pond <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I i went across the pond to can um <laughs> it's my first time heading to can since 2019 I was gonna go in 2020 little thing happened don't really remember what it was all i remember is it disrupted the festival that year um but now <laughs> yeah w- was able to go again uh can was awesome saw a lot of great movies including of course uh killers of the flower moon scorsese flick which i almost feel like in the spirit of not spoiling things like spoiling our opinions on the podcast i'm gonna assume you've refrained from reading anything i said about anything and we just should never talk about how i feel about <laughs> movies until we re- <laughs> record reviews of them um but i a lot of great stuff. <laughs> um, see, there's this little company that's trying to stay in business. And one of the ways it tries to do that is to just send me emails with snip- snapshots of your Twitter timeline. So you you already know I loved Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I... it ruled. <laughs> um, big, big fan of like all the things that are coming out soon. I was quite a fan of Asteroid City, I think is really interesting. I think the first half is going to scare a lot of people away narratively and if you stick with it it, it has some really really cool tricks up its sleeve i uh, was a big fan of that one uh-huh. elemental made me cry and was my favorite animated movie of this year for about six days <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm, i wonder what that could mean yeah excited to talk about that one um but honestly, what I love about festivals like this, and it's the same with when we do Sundance or TIFF or anything else, it, it isn't the big headliners. It's all the things that you probably never would have caught otherwise, you never would have caught up with if you didn't know about. And, and that is what was great. I saw 36 things, movies from all over the world. It just, it, it's a lot of fun. I love just being in a place surrounded by people who just want to do crazy shit, like watch... Steve McQueen's four and a half hour Holocaust documentary (laughs) Um, (laughs) and have your mind blown and have it be amazing when you just would never have that kind of patience or resolve at home. Um, So yeah, can was great. Lots of amazing stuff coming out zone of interest, probably going to be the best movie this year. Um, Really depressing though. So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see within the next year or two when all these movies actually hit what, what the reception is going to be. It's always fun seeing like the bubble when you're there versus the, the acclaim that things get when they actually go, go wide. But yeah, the one thing that has continued that I will say at Cannes is much like Triangle of Sadness won the Palme d'Or last year. And you and I watched that. And I would say actively disliked a lot of it, or at least were very much um, mixed. Actively disliked is definitely a fair assessment of how I felt about the yeah. film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this year, there were multiple comedies that premiered in competition. Both performed like gangbusters in the auditorium. Like, people loved them. And I did not hate them. The, the two comedies were um, Fallen Leaves by Aki Karzmaki and A Brighter Tomorrow um, by someone whose name is escaping me, an Italian director. Um, both of them, people love to laugh. They love to laugh in these like depressing festivals otherwise. And you get the sense that like people are just so happy to finally have something light that they can enjoy. Um, Fallen Leaves, though, was getting the kind of acclaim that made me think it was going to win the Palme d'Or. And to me, it was just a completely fine, charming, three-star, 3.5-star little thing. 
And I have a feeling that is going to go wide and get the kind of like IndieWire says this is the funniest movie since, you know, um, some like it hot type of thing <laughs> that is going to just completely tank it when it actually hits yeah. theaters and people watch it and go like, that was nice. <laughs> that, that was fine. <laughs> So I don't know. I'm curious to keep an eye on the comedies, especially. But had a great time. Was a lot of fun. Excited to do it again someday. Maybe not next year. Maybe I will uh, give <laughs> my, it off here. my friends and family and work a little bit more love and not always take two weeks off over my birthday and go halfway across the world. Yeah, and that, that, that's it. You, you celebrated her birthday, too. So uh, mm-hmm. happy birthday. Thank you. Oh, one, one final thing I have to call out. Uh, Corey Ada's monster. I know you were more hot on Broker than I was. Uh, we both were into shoplifters, though I think you had some like plotty things working against you. <laughs> I think you are going to fucking adore Monster when it comes right. out. I think this is going to be like the home run Corey Ada movie for you. Um, and I'm excited. I'm excited to see when that happens. All right. Great. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm excited now as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right but we're not here to talk about all those films it, it's funny you saw 36 films i don't know if we've done 36 reviews this year so far <laughs> i know yeah <laughs> but we're getting back into it and we're we're coming out swinging with a return to the podcast oh with yeah like a pretty huge film here um you know spider-man across the spider-verse steven what did you think of spider-man into the spider-verse yeah, so I I really enjoyed Spider Man Into the Spider Verse. I don't think we recorded a review of it. I think I caught it late. Honestly, I might have gone to can when that came out. I I didn't check what time of year in twenty eighteen. I'm like, we have to have a review of that, right? <laughs> I I could be wrong. Um, I just I feel like I caught it late because I believe I was with a friend oh. and somewhat inebriated when I watched it. <laughs> that that's that's a hundred percent true because I was going to get uh I was gonna bring on a ringer um to to take your place for that episode and uh they did not join us for that review. Um so mm. yeah, we must have just not done a review. And it obviously got talked about a bit in our end of the year episodes, um, because it was something that came up there. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I think that is correct i don't know it wasn't over can because it was in december that it came out that year so i'm not sure what i was doing or why we weren't able to record together but i know i really liked it a lot but i i did one of those things where i like hung out with a friend had a few drinks went to the movie theater loved my time but i wasn't i wasn't watching it with like critical faculties turned up a hundred percent so I always had a little asterisk in my love of that movie of like, I believe it is great, but I know it deserves a rewatch before I can really do it justice. Uh, And semi spoilers, uh, right before recording this, I rewatched 85% (laughs) of Into the Spider-Verse and my memory was correct. Uh, It's great. And, And what I remembered most was the animation style, especially around action sequences, the way they're willing to play with physics, make everything into a comic book, follow a kind of tonal logic rather than a physical logic. And there's just so much creativity and combining that with the kind of Lord and Miller house production style of jokes where things just come fast and furious and they do not care whether or not you are picking up all of them makes it just a dizzying, really fun time. Uh, So yeah, the movie holds up great. Loved it at the time. Still, still love it. Yeah, I, I it, it was a you know big favorite of mine the year it came out. Um, I absolutely loved the, that film as well. Um, you know, I <laughs> I love these films that can be super inventive but still have like characters that actually make you care about like what's going on there. The stakes are important. This that film had a great villain. Um, you know, and, and honestly, it was a a lot to try to follow up for this film that we sat down to watch. I mean, that that is a film that won won an Oscar and it's kind of like yeah. how could they possibly follow up a film that great with something um that could even, you know, hold a candle uh whether that be digital <laughs> or print uh yeah. to the film that we that we had seen and loved so much back in 2018. Um but that film is here. We saw it and we're going to talk about it. It may or may not be the film that unseated Elemental as Steven's favorite uh, animated film of the year for 6 days, but 
should we talk about this david should we let the folks know what we thought of this film yes let's let's dive in all right let's take a listen to the trailer for spider-man across the spider-verse and then come back and give everyone a review my name is miles morales i'm brooklyn's one and only spider-man and things are going great oh yeah you were supposed to be here fine all right whatever whatever wow whatever so are you like a cow or a dalmatian i am the spot (laughs) it's not funny don't don't do that Miles's grades are pretty good. A in AP Physics. That's my little man. And a B in Spanish. What? Ooh, okay. Miles. Are you trying Mira, to kill that's what I'm I gotta go. All right, have a bye. He's lying to you. And I think you know it. What's up, danger? Miles! Wanna get out of here? Oh, when? So wait a minute. There's an elite crew with all the best spider people in it? Right. Who's the new guy? This is unbelievable. This is the lobby. Miguel O'Hara. The whole thing was his idea. What's a guy got to do to join this spider team? You can never be part of this. Don't even get me started on Doctor Strange and the little nerd back on Earth 1999-99. Come on, go easy on the kid. He had a terrible teacher. Peter. Bye. You have a baby? I have a baby. I'll take it from here. Miles, being Spider-Man is a sacrifice. You have a choice between saving one person and saving every world. Send me home. I can't do that. I can do both! Spider-Man, always. Not always. What about Uncle Ben? If not for Uncle Ben, most of us wouldn't be here. Can't stop me now! You can't run forever, kid! I can't lose one more friend. The count isn't what we talked about! You know it? I no idea what you're doing! Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. I'm gonna do my own thing. All stations, stop Spider Man. You, you know what I mean? And then I looked at my uncle and. Uh, let me guess. He died. All right, so that was the trailer for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Um, this is the follow-up to the 2018 film Into the Spider-Verse. And in this story, our, our our hero, Miles Morales, you know, he's been a little bit lonely. He's been having a good time being the friendly neighborhood uh, Spider-Man. But he's sort of longed for that connection to the other spider folk that he had met in the previous film. And due to some circumstances, actually gets in touch with people from another different verses and has to go on a big adventure to, I don't know, maybe learn some stuff about himself and uh, maybe find out some stuff about the broader Spider-Verse and the interconnectedness of it. Stephen Miller, what did you think of Across the Spider-Verse? So, so Chris, when we reviewed Ant-Man Quantumania, Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, excuse me, I, uh, <laughs> I think Wasp there were two erasure. things. Yeah, there, there were two things that I felt like I was getting very tired of in comic book movies in general. One was that kind of Joss Whedon-y, quippy house style where everything has to be a joke and therefore it's undermining the gravitas of what's going on. And the second was the multiverse, the reliance on multiple universes being so heavy that it made it feel like there was no one reality and therefore no one canonical thing that could happen. I felt like both of those were kind of dead ends that the MCU in particular had dug itself into that it, it just made it hard to have any fun. And I just wanted something to reset, to do the opposite, to snap me out of it. Um, Guardians 3 made me think, okay, they can snap out of it. They can tell me one simple story. They can take their own narrative seriously. The jokes won't be at the expense of the action that's taking place. This is the path forward. Across the Spider-Verse makes me think like, no, You can do all of that shit. You just have to do it well. (laughs) And if you do it well enough, I will adore it. And I adored this movie. I thought this movie was absolutely fantastic. And it's basically the dumb and dumber meme of like, and then you go and do something like this and totally redeem yourself. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
And I went into this before my rewatch of Into the Spider-Verse. So I did not remember much of anything about the actual lore of the Spider-Verse saga. Um, I remembered that there had been multiple spider people. I didn't quite remember what happened to them. I didn't watch any trailer for Across the Spider-Verse, so I truly had absolutely no idea what was going to happen or who was going to show up. And the movie opens with Gwen in her Spider-Gwen universe telling a story as if you know all of the details already of what was going to happen. And honestly, at least at Alamo, telling it in a volume where compared to the music, you can't even catch all the details. And for about two seconds, I was like, oh, God, <laughs> I didn't do my homework. <laughs> I'm not going to remember anything. I'm not even going to be able to follow this. And then the artistic style of the movie just like overwhelmed me. I just fell into it. And I didn't care. I didn't care at all that I could not remember which Peter Parker is showing up or why he feels fondly about Miles Morales or what Miles and Gwen's history was in the last movie or any, it didn't matter. None of it mattered because this movie looks and feels so fucking amazing. Um, yeah. It is, I mean, we can spend the whole review just talking about the art direction. It is amazing. There are, I think six different universes that are shown in this movie. Each one has their own visual style. And the first movie had playful visual styles, especially with the little dips into the multiverse and a few of the action sequences. Across the Spider-Verse makes Into the Spider-Verse look like a straightforward comic book movie. <laughs> um, yeah, and, 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 and to be fair... In that first film, the other universe was coming to Miles' universe. So it was yeah. like they were the visual fish out of water. And now it's we right. are going into where everything is wildly different. And it really explodes that out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, you know, the original movie, the art direction is awesome. But it is all one thing, which is that kind of like, I don't know what you call it, like the, the point-based comic book design where every... Everything, even though it's in 3D, it looks like it was... Um, is it half tone? Is that what it's called? Y yeah, maybe half tone. Like, it, it looks like it was rotoscoped to have this, like, very physical manual. Somebody blotted every dot by hand in these characters' world. And it's very, very cool. It, it is a very cool aesthetic. It is one aesthetic. Um, <laughs> this movie... <laughs> Not only does this movie have many, many, many different aesthetics that it wildly embraces, I think even in Miles' universe here, they embrace the kind of like abstract rule of how things can look and feel and interact with each other that is just like unbelievably cool to watch. I like this movie could have been two hours of just like colors flashing in front of me <laughs> and I would have had a had a blast. Um, so, some it, might say it is. <laughs> Yeah, some <laughs> some might say it is. Um, and look, I'm I'm, I'm just going to spoil the final thing. I'm definitely giving this a must see. I love I love this movie. Um, I loved it so much that I can find plenty of things to criticize that will not even make a dent in my final rating. For example, the story. I like it. I like the story. It's cool. It is fun. I, I don't know that the story is as tight as the first movie. I, I think it isn't, right? Um, they're trying to blow open the universe, and so they have a million things going on, which makes them have multiple kind of bad guys and multiple... It isn't as clean narratively, and maybe that's because this is one half of a story that is going to be finished next year. Um, but I can give it that. There, There's also some of the comedy... It has that, again, I, I don't want to attribute this to Lord and Miller because I know there are huge creative teams that work on this movie and they didn't even direct it. Um, but it has that kind of Lego movie style where the jokes come so fast and furious that I cannot possibly catch all of them. And that isn't yeah. my absolute favorite. You know, the Lego movie, I, I loved it, but it kind of stressed me out <laughs> while I was watching it. <laughs> and. Across the Spider-Verse sometimes kind of stressed me out when I, when I was watching it, just like the velocity of everything that was coming toward me. There's also some kind of weird cop-related stuff that like grinds the movie to a halt that they like should be a little bit smarter than doing the way that they did. Um, none of that do I really care about, though, because this movie is just like such a phenomenal experience from beginning to end. It is like... I genuinely think this movie is groundbreaking and of a piece with 
everything everywhere all at once in that it feels like a new type of storytelling for the era we are in right now where everyone is so overwhelmed and distracted and doesn't know how to grapple with things. These are movies that just come at you and say, here is all the stuff at once. I'm going to trust you to grok something that you cannot possibly actually take in all at one time. And I'm just going to trust you to feel the overwhelming emotions that we are throwing at you and turn them into something meaningful and logical. And I think th th this movie just fucking rules. <laughs> it it yeah. rules so hard. It, the criticisms don't even matter because it's just an A plus amazing. Um, yeah. Amazing ride. Yeah. I, I, th I think that this film is absolutely fantastic. You know, I, I, I said at the beginning that, you know, I, I I wasn't prepared for how good this could be just because I expected, like, it, it's going to be hard to do a follow-up to the first film. And But they, they knocked it out of the park. But not only was I not prepared for how good it could be, but I was not prepared for how, like, emotional this film could be. This is a film that really is, is like, dealing with a lot of themes. Like, obviously, there was always the themes of, like, you know, the parents and, you know, this love of a parent towards a child. Um, but the way that they extrapolate that out and go to so many different characters with those same themes and really let you feel the relationship between people and the the conflict. Like, you know, Peter Parker character has all, like, you know, Spider-Man character has always had to deal with how do I be a kid and also be a superhero and this bouncing of this like high school life with with doing this role that I think I'm supposed to do. But really, this film takes that and it's not about can I do my homework, and get that done on time? Can I still play in the school? I mean, it still has the school elements, but it's really about the family mm -hmm. dynamic. And and it's more about it's not just, oh, can my girlfriend know I'm Spider-Man? It is can all these people in my life know it? Can I continue to disappoint them and not live up to the potential they see in me, even though I am sort of basically creating my own potential on my side. And, and like, there was a lot of like moments where like out of nowhere, it's just this huge emotional gut punch that you get. Like even mm -hmm. like in the first like 10 minutes of the film, there's this hug that Gwen's, <laughs> Gwen gives oh, to yeah. her father where, and it's almost like a flash where it's like, she's about to go out a door and she just whips around and gives a hug. And I was like, why am I almost crying? <laughs> like, yeah, th nothing has happened. It was just a person. It's like just the, the animation, the visual representation of that moment. And like the pause that it sort of lingers on there is enough to communicate like 30 minutes of exposition that could have led to that emotional outcome, but they just get it instantly somehow just because of what they're trying to do there. Um, and like that, that I was kind of floored because it's kind of throughout, even if you, yeah. you know, you, you talked a little bit about how there's a little bit of confusion in the plot of just like so many different villains and stuff. And like, even the villains have kind of the same emotional arc as the, you know, the, the character that we're rooting for, right? It's like, you know exactly why somebody feels a certain way. And it's kind of about, can you live up to this potential yourself and be mm -hmm. this thing that you want? You know, the first, uh, you know, this, this film does a really, really, a very interesting thing that in a weaker film, I would kind of complain about. Um, and that is, it takes one of the faults of all of the representations of Spider-Man and turns that into a strength of storytelling of like, mm -hmm. it directly deals with the idea of the the canon and you know like the, yeah. the joke about watching batman films it's like how many times we have to fucking see his parents get killed right this film right. you know spider-man also has that sort of thing you know people kind of i think people are more accepting of of the spider-man deaths that always happen in all these stories just because something about it but like they complain more about it in the batman universe right but in this film it's directly yeah. dealing with like yes we've made a million of these films and yes they all have these same beats in it but there's a very specific reason for those beats and if you stray from those here's why we couldn't stray from them all these other times that we've done the story you have to do it mm -hmm. because everything depends on that sort of thing and i like the inventiveness of that um it's also doing another weird thing which is kind of like the first film is is sort of about um you know, uh, you know, Miles not being good enough at being Spider-Man, he's sort of accidentally thrust in this and he has to learn to be able to be Spider-Man. And, you know, that story was really about like, and everyone can be a Spider-Man, kind of like uh, there was yeah. a little Star Wars film recently that was kind of about anybody yeah. could be a force yeah, user, which right? Everyone, which everyone loved. <laughs> <laughs> which everyone loved. And then immediately the next film tries to rip that away and say like, no, it can't be just anyone. Like, you don't belong here or, or you know, 
<laughs> maybe broom boy doesn't belong here right <laughs> mm -hmm. and in this universe miles is potentially the broom boy right like he has been given this power he has access to it but he's not he's dealing with the ramifications of i just taught myself that i could do it and now i'm finding out that maybe i didn't deserve to to have it maybe it was an accident that i got this power and though i did my best with it maybe not everybody believes that i can actually do it and it's sort of this like really deep emotional connection to what uh miles is trying to be and sort of what he can be in the way the rest of the world sort of sees it and his loneliness and his wanting to be a part of a bigger world and then maybe potentially being like partially rejected by different people from that world like it's all like like the stakes are just as high as they can possibly be plus the villain's fucking fat ass <laughs> Yeah, like, like it's one of those things that like it starts fun and slowly ramps up and by the end you're just like holy shit this is amazing and scary and what the hell is going to happen um so I'll, I'll like all the way along this ride it's been a great journey there's a bunch of set off and pay set up and payoff things that like it, it they do that fine line of like they they hinted at it but you were so mm -hmm. invested in enjoying the film that you didn't really think about it. And then you catch on like 5.7 seconds before the reveal happens. Yep. And you're like, oh, fucking of course. Oh, my God. Yep. It was so it was right there on the screen. And then I didn't even think about it. But now that it's happening, I'm like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And like there, there's constantly moments where you're like, holy shit, this is the greatest film I've ever seen. Um, and this is a film, like, I, I had completely forgot that this is a part one of a two-part story. Yeah, I never knew. And... I was completely surprised when the credits came up. <laughs> but it was one of those things where, like, unlike unlike Dune, where I was like, you told me half a story. I was like, holy shit, this is the greatest cliffhanger that's ever existed in film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it was just one of those things where as it was happening, I was like, oh, my God, they're going to fucking end the movie right here. This is so badass. Oh, my God, I love it. And then as soon as the film was over, I was like, that was amazing. When does this next fucking movie come out? Because I cannot yeah. wait. Over, I can't wait a year. I, I think it's supposed to come out in March if it keeps that date. Um, here, here's my question for you, Stephen. First film received an Oscar. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you remember back to uh, the, the Matrix uh, trilogy, when they, the, the second two films, I believe they released them like three months apart or something like that, where it was like, mm. You know, because they filmed them all at once and they prepped them all at once and they were ready to release them. And I think it was like a thing where it's like this, the third one was at Christmas and then the second one was like a few months earlier. I feel mm. like they could do that with this film, right? They have to be far enough mm. along that like they could do that. But they're like, I mean, the first one got an Oscar. We could drop two in one year. But like, what if we got three Oscars? <laughs> yeah. What if we what if we just steal the crown from Pixar three movies in a row? I, I respect it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just seems like it's like like I I I, I appreciate the rationale behind it. But they could just freaking drop this movie in like three months, right? Or at least Christmas, yeah. right? Give it to me at Christmas. Mm -hmm. First one was at Christmas. This one's halfway through the year. Give us a Christmas. Okay, film. we've got, we've gotten to bargaining, so we're we're halfway to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to acceptance. acceptance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not really that far away. It's okay. I can mm. live till March. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I, I I hear you. I mean, I want to mainline more of this movie, more of this universe, multiverse, and it it is frustrating to have to wait. But I do just like, it, even just hearing you talk about emotionally what you love about this movie, it nails it so hard. And again, it nails it when I remembered almost nothing plot-wise about the first movie at all. I was not invested in Miles and Gwen, uh, the the relationship they had. I was not invested in Miles's origin story or how it differed from others or what it meant. This movie communicated all of that so quickly, so well, efficiently. You know, that little hug from Gwen made me want to cry also. I was like, I don't remember who this person is. I don't remember anything about her. But that hug she just gave her dad, I'm feeling it. And like, and they add the world that she lives in is all kind of abstract and impressionistic where like the colors behind her change depending on how her mood and emotions are. And, and it works so well on me. Um, Miles and Gwen, you know, the, the Miles is a teenager, more of a teenager in this movie. Like he's clearly grown up a little bit and he and Gwen <laughs> he's just have hit puberty some... for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. They Finally. Joke about that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, he and Gwen have just this kind of amazing connection. And, and again, the meta commentary they do about how 
you know, Spider-Man always falls for Gwen and it never works out. And the commentary this movie is doing on canon and tropes and how much can you color outside the lines. It, it It's all just great. And I have to talk about it is hard to pick a best moment in this movie because all of it is so damn good. But there is a scene that the Internet is all, you know, grabbing screenshots of already um, of Miles and Gwen sitting upside down looking at the Manhattan skyline from Brooklyn. And it is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It it is just unbelievably lovely. (laughs) So so here, sorry sorry to interject, but like this is another one of those things where it's done so well that I love it. But part of me under any other circumstance would complain because it's like, remember the first trailer where it's that like him diving into the city upwards, but upside down. Right. It's like, Mm -hmm. that was iconic, badass looked amazing. And they're just like, we gotta, we gotta have another upside down city shot. Like we need that. Now we established that as being this beautiful thing. And it's like, it's, they earn it though. And it feels correct. And it's amazing. But also you're like, we get an upside down city, but it's like any other film that's just trying to re, these visual references to itself would be mm-hmm. like you know annoying on some level and for some reason in this it just it's like yeah of course you're gonna fucking do the shot because you need to I, because they I want mean, it well in this franchise has that kind of get out of jail free card where they're like we are commenting on ourselves that it, that is what we're doing and so it kind of gets away with anything it fucking wants to <laughs> like mm-hmm. this movie does it, it does the upside down city shot But now it is a calm, peaceful, two spider people looking out at what had been action at a distance and just resting for a minute. And I don't know if they intended that to be a commentary or like subverting what the prior movie had done with that visual. But I I can tell it that like it it feels so smart. I can impart anything (laughs) onto this movie and it feels like something in it meant to do it. It it, it feels like it can communicate just everything. And that is a a magic trick. I also I mentioned like the velocity of jokes in this movie and I'm I'm just getting old. You know, I'm an old (laughs) geezer. I'm not uh, I'm not young enough for this speed of jokes, even everything everywhere all at once. When I the first time I watched it, there was a moment where I was like, I can't keep up with all the jokes. I can't I can't do it. I can't follow you guys anymore. Um, But but could it be that Asteroid City changed because the slowness of the way the jokes come out in those films? I feel mm. like it just it just it reversed your ability to keep Maybe, up with yeah. the quick, yeah, yeah, quick, yeah. quick, quick. Yeah, it, it just slowed me down. It, it slowed <laughs> me down for a little bit. But even with that said, I love the humor of this movie. Like, um, there is a moment, uh, a sequence that I think is a great example of everything they do so well, and that is, do I want to spoil the name? In a pre-spoiler section, yeah, oh, why not? I'm sure people have talked about it. They go to Mumbatan, um, yeah. like a Mumbai-Manhattan combination, um, and they meet Pav, who is like the Spider-Man from India. And it is a sequence where they are dropped into this world that probably has pre-existing IP. I admit I didn't look it up, so I don't know if this is based on an actual comic series or if this is an invention of the filmmakers. But it is... It is bright it is extreme it is making a billion jokes spider-man related jokes jokes about how this would adapt to indian culture um they have little self-referential things where miles is going on a rant about atm machines or pin numbers or something earlier this spider-man is going on a rant about non-bread or chai tea you know they they have the exact same kind of joke um it is like they're steering into this thing that could have been a throwaway gag it could have been a 21 jump street cutaway of like one of the sequels of that movie or in the first movie it could have been like a you know 30 second origin story that a character reveals before snapping back to miles's universe but they live in this universe for like 20 minutes and they have so many jokes and they are told so lovingly but it is extreme it is fearless it is not it, it is like it's just like effortlessly cool and diverse and open and willing to be stupid about itself and willing to say when it doesn't understand something and it it does everything so well and my audience was just roaring with laughter and i think it it just feels really good when you find a creative team that is willing to just like 
go all out with comedy and be unafraid in the process. And it just feels so like, it just feels good. I don't know. It feels good in a way that like Ted Lasso season one felt good for me where I'm just like, you're just <laughs> nailing everything and you're a big warm hug and you love me and you love everybody. And I just love sitting here yeah, <laughs> um, laughing with you. Yeah. And, and like, you know, with, with, with how fast all those jokes come, I think that the, the, the humor in this film is a lot like the, uh, the Easter eggs, where it's like you're not even supposed to pick up on all the jokes uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the first time around. It's like something that's going to reward repeat viewing. And like, the, yes, there's the main yeah. jokes that you're following, but there's probably all kinds of little jokes in the background or, you know, titles of Spider's Man that uh, you didn't have enough time to read because there were like 10 on the screen at once and you were trying to follow everything. Like, there's just so many visual gags where it felt like anybody was allowed to do whatever they wanted in the context of that. Like even some of those action scenes where there's so many people jumping around, it's like, did they just say like, Hey, you're going to get these like 45 frames. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have free reign to do whatever you want with any reference you yeah. could possibly think of. And it's just going to happen and go for it. Um, you know, it, it, it feels like it just at some point it just had to be like that, right? Just just put whatever you yeah, want. I can't in there. even imagine the army, the army of animators it takes yeah. to make one sequence in this movie. Yeah, I, I, I want to know what was involved in like, um, like I remember when, uh, you know, it, it used to be a thing that they did all the time. Maybe it was just because there was like more of those uh, like Cinefix magazine or whatever it was, uh, you know, there'd be things where they'd be like, oh yeah, Scanner Darkly came out and like it took like, you know, this long just to render all those flowers at the end of the film or do whatever. Or they'd be like, oh, this Transformer movie was, it was like 48 hours per frame to to render out this thing, you know, like that kind of stuff. I want to know what's yeah. involved and how, is it is it more difficult to like render and composite all these wildly different animation styles or is it kind of like it's all pixels so it doesn't matter like i i, I want to know what's involved in it and, and i have how to assume works. it's more difficult because there's like no shortcuts there's no optimizations there's no anything that would work when you have like every <laughs> character obeying their own laws I, I i assume animated in their own frame rate like i i don't even know what goes into making all of this work it, yeah, it, it, it is just like it boggles the mind um any any more pre spoiler I assume we're gonna talk spoilers for this film. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I think we should go across the spoiler verse and uh <laughs> Yeah, wrap wrap with the pre spoiler stuff now. Cool. Um I will say just one one uh one one spoiler gag uh just before we get to spoilers, that is one of my favorite jokes of the film. Is just the DJ turning up the music. Oh yeah. When the family's starting to argue. <laughs> That was good. Little things like that where it feels like background characters are like fully fledged reactions to what everybody is participating in. Like with so much stuff going on at that party, like I want to be able to just watch, like pick a character and watch them in the background and see what kind of reactions we're getting out of them. Yep. Oh yeah. I am I am bummed that this movie isn't already available on VOD because I want to watch and rewatch it and scrub through scenes. Uh, I don't even understand how people are pulling out screenshots from this movie. I guess it's all in the trailer or something like that. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. TV yeah. spots, all sorts of like different <laughs> things. Because <laughs> I assume maybe, nobody's maybe like. Maybe I have to go back to Alamo tonight. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, that is that is the one thing. I definitely didn't have time uh, to go back and see this again. Um, and also, that's mm -hmm. the other thing, too. Like, I, I talked about, like, I feel like it's the Oscar thing that's making them not release this film early. Um, the other thing is, you know, we've been talking recently about how, like, we'll, we'll see something in theaters. We'll finally put out the review. And then, like, the next Tuesday, that is out on VOD. This, this shit ain't coming to VOD anytime no, soon. No, no. They are going to hold this in theaters as long as they possibly can. And then eventually oh, yeah. we'll get it like minimum, like the, the old 45 day window, probably. Yep. If we're lucky. Yeah. And good for them. I, I want this to be like the dark horse of the summer that like gets more, more cash than anyone thought an animated film could. I think that would be a wonderful success story. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, it's about time for spoilers. But before we can do that, for anybody who's not going to stick around, we're going to do our verdicts for this. So, Stephen Miller, if you're going to give us a must-see, recommend with a caveat, wave rental pass with a caveat, must avoid. You already said it, but you need to say it officially now. What would you give this film? 
a must-see, absolutely. This, this movie fucking rules, and as much as I want it on VOD so I can scrub through scenes, I think the theatrical experience is rewarding for this, and you should definitely go out and support this with your dollars ASAP. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, it's a must-see from me as well. Um, yeah, see, that's the thing is I, I won't even be able to do the nice scrubbing through because I'm going to get it on iTunes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And Apple is not exactly friendly about allowing screenshots or any of that fun stuff. So I, don't, I, I think you'll find a way. I don't know what I'm going to do, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that is the non-spoiler part of our review of uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. We are going to say goodbye to everybody who's not going to stick with us for now. Stephen Miller, if people want to find you throughout the week, where can they do that? Uh, people can find me at twitter.com slash sdavidmiller or sdavidmiller.com where you can... Also read a big old can roundup if you want to hear about the other 33 movies I saw. And people can find me at ChristopherInRealLife.com or Twitter.com slash ChristopherRL. You can find the podcast over at TheSpoilerWarning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so on Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. Um, if you want to know the episodes go live, you can follow us at Twitter.com slash SpoilerWarning, Facebook.com slash TheSpoilerWarning, or Instagram.com slash TheSpoilerWarning. If you want to get a hold of us directly, you can send an email to fans at TheSpoilerWarning.com, or you can use the contact form on our site. Music for this episode will come from a track selected from Artlist.io, so hopefully you're enjoying that. And uh, yeah, we are uh, firing up the particle accelerator um, <laughs> portal device, and uh, we are going to transition over across into the Spoilerverse um, so get ready for that. That music's going to fade up. The music fades out. We'll be in spoilers, so watch out. All right, we are back. This is spoiler territory. It's the after part of our review of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. We are talking full-blown spoilers, so watch out. Here they come. Stephen Miller, where do we want to start with this fantastic little film? I don't even know. I don't I, I don't know how you begin to start spoiling this movie. There's so <laughs> much shit happening in it. I'll, I'll go where you lead me. I, I have a feeling you have a, an ordering in your head. I mean, we can start with the big, the big, big uh, one, which is like the big twist ending of this film. Um, right. If we wanted to start there and then kind of like fizzle sure. off <laughs> as yeah. we go. Um, yeah. So at the at the end of this film, um, uh, Miles uh, sneaks his way back to what he thinks is his uh, his verse, his universe. Um, and he goes in, to see his mom and, uh, you know finds out his uncle is there who is supposed to be dead um at least was dead in his universe he starts to realize something is amiss and then uh he starts to fear that uh you know something's not not what is he expecting and he ends up encountering himself as the prowler um so this character hmm. that in his universe his uncle uh was or turned into or whatever and instead in the universe that he gets sent back to which is actually the universe where the spider that bit him in the first film came from glitched in his universe from um and I, I i don't know about you steven but like i love the idea of so we have the, we have this character of miles who worried about not being able to live up to what spider-man is um and then had to gain the strength and the self-resolve the ability to use his powers um has 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 tried to work on becoming the person that he thinks he's supposed to be. Then he spends this entire film having people tell him you're not supposed to be this person, and then is imme right. immediately um, put in touch with the idea that in a world where the spider didn't cross over from another world and interrupt his path, his path that he could have been on was to become the prowler, uh, which is this thing that obviously uh, is it's not not the good old wholesome neighborhood Spider-Man that he is. Like, I love that as sort of, you know, like we already have this idea of this nemesis, right? These two people whose yeah. origin point is the same thing. And like the, the big bad of spot being his nemesis, like that is already super impressive. But then when it turns out that his actual nemesis is himself or the alternate mm -hmm. reality of what he could have become if he didn't become Spider-Man chef's kiss. Like I loved it. It was great. No, it <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's awesome. It it is really really cool. It th my only 
thought there and I, and I think it's awesome I loved it it's one of those things like you said 5.6 seconds before the reveal I was like oh shit I know what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> um and, and it was awesome I can't decide if so you are saying if not for the spider that bit you this could have been your future and I can't decide how close world 42 I, I think that's the number is to his world or if it is that is the world without spider-man and therefore it's back to the future to the part when everything is miserable because you know um some terrible thing was never averted yeah I, I am not as certain how close that miles is to this miles in terms of like this could be you but for one or two different changes um or how much is it just an awesome way to have his nemesis be himself, which I love anyway. The The only other thought I have there to just like dampen it a little bit is I think making his version of Uncle Ben, Uncle Aaron, be the Prowler in his universe is already such a fucking amazing subversion of this trope. This is just like a cherry on top. But I think yeah. they the core thing that they already did was blur the line between villain and hero and inspiring family figure and bad guy. Um, and now they're just continuing to unravel that thread in a kind of amazing way that is questioning the whole meaning of all of these canons and lores and whether we should upend them and start over. And I, I think just awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah it was great. Um uh, man, it's so funny. Like you were gone um, when uh, "Knock at the Cabin" <laughs> came mm -hmm. out. Yeah, and uh, like I, I've, I, I think that's a terrible film. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a film that I hated. But like the basic premise of that is like, what if, what if a bunch of people showed up and said, uh, "You need to kill somebody. Uh, you have yeah. to make a sacrifice. One of y'all has to die." in order to avert this apocalypse and like this is like the super awesome great version of that story where it's not just like some fucking people come out of nowhere with no evidence that they are actually beings connected to something and then a bunch of fantastical people coming from fantastical universes that allowed you to even connect in the first place have observed fallouts from breaking canon before like i don't know it's just it's such a better right. way of doing this story but it's still a thing where it's like uh, you know, it's kind of funny because like Miles is they are saying, Miles, you weren't supposed to exist. Well, if he already didn't, you know, if he already existed incorrectly out of the world, then why does he have to participate even in the canons that are there? Right. Yeah, like, exactly. He, he isn't the Peter from the universe where he is, was. He's already fucked it up. It's already wildly thrown off. Can it get that much more thrown off? <laughs> yeah, well, and I, and I kind of think that is the arc that he's going on is like I he doesn't adhere to their definition of canon of what is supposed to exist. And because of that, it is liberating, right? That's why he can also turn invisible and also shoot lightning. It's why like he breaks the rules and it's embracing that you don't need to follow the rules to a T and maybe these are meant to be broken. Um, an interesting thing, and this is kind of the next place we can go because we've already talked about it is, yeah, so he makes it to... Um, the that what do they call spider hq like the yeah, the world <laughs> the world where all the spider people are are gathered together the spider and dome he gets the, <laughs> yeah and, and he gets that uh that big talk of you know there are canon events you need to respect that that this has occurred um your father is going to die in two days from now and you need to let it happen. You know, he has that, they have that whole conversation and he is told, like Miguel tells him, you are an anomaly. You're not supposed to be here. You are the original anomaly. And the thing that I thought was interesting, and I wonder if the third movie is going to dig into this or not, is he's not the only anomaly. Like Gwen, I would argue, is very much an anomaly too in a similar vein as him where it is you are traditionally a different character in Peter Parker's story, but because of the order of how things went down, you are the spider person. And in both cases, the Peter Parker died instead because Peter had to become something else and that just didn't work out. Um, 
And I kind of wonder if where they're headed with the third movie is Miles and Gwen embracing their anomaly status and it being a kind of commentary on what kind of superhero stories get made and just like tying it all together in a really, really interesting way. That, that was just one thing where I was like, isn't Gwen an anomaly too? Why are they not staring at her and telling her that she can't be, you know, can't be all this? Yeah, so it, it was weird too because there's a scene where, you know, Gwen goes back and sees her, her, her father and then she finds out that her father has quit. And she reacts in a way that I couldn't tell in the moment whether it was her being glad that he quit or scared. Like, what was she happy that he quit because it means he doesn't have to die? Or mm. was she scared that because he quit, it meant the universe was going to collapse? You know, like, I couldn't tell whether mm. it was like, was it her proving to herself that it's not actually an issue? Or was it her freaking out that it could be an issue? Or was it her just being like, oh, thank God, you're no longer a, <laughs> a captain? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, and and I assume the third movie is going to introduce some doubt into this before it resolves it for us. I assume she is realizing that it you can be liberated from the idea that all the stories have to go the same way. Like, the idea is you don't reveal who you are throw that out the window maybe it'll work out the idea is you have to lose someone close to you maybe you don't and i i saw it as a sigh of relief when that happened not a a fear that something terrible was going to happen so do you think do you think that spot or super spot whatever whatever his his final evolved form is Mm -hmm. that miles will somehow convince him to be good and that it's his portal power that will eventually lead to unbreaking the chains that like all the dominoes that are falling now like do you think he mm-hmm. somehow convinces him that like we're not nemesis we're both counter to what is expected of this world and we can actually work together to solve this problem that we have generated in our battling over the fact that we both feel like we didn't belong and needed to prove to people that we could belong <laughs> interesting I, I like it uh <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say maybe. I, it, Because one thing that it isn't suffering from it, this movie isn't suffering from anything, but I, I mentioned there's like multiple villains and it kind of feels like Miguel and Spot, they're not fighting for screen time, but Spot feels like a distraction from the true quote villain of Miguel, who is like the person who actually has a kind of um, philosophic absolutism that is driving him to make decisions that are calloused, which is kind of like the the classic, you know, villain behavior (laughs) in these things. And it would be fitting if, like, it it seems obvious that Miguel is going to be the one to turn back to being good again. It'd be kind of cool if Spot turns back to being good and they both work together to stop Miguel. (laughs) I I think that would actually be a really cool twist for the third movie. I I, I will say uh, about the Miguel stuff... um... There's a thing that happens in some of these animated films. Like, obviously, like, if, if you think about it on paper, there's tons of wild violence that's happening in all these stories, right? Um, yeah. But it's, like, animated, so you're kind of with it, and, like, no one's really getting hurt. They're just getting, like, smashed mm-hmm. into the wall and stuff like that. Like, obviously, characters die, yeah. but, like, you're a little bit hidden. Like, they just get scratches and maybe a little little drip of blood or something like that, right? But there are moments that become emotionally violent in the way things are depicted. You know, like one good example uh, would be like the, that fight towards the end of uh, Civil Bro, right? Where like, Mm -hmm. you know, they're all fighting and like, they're about like, uh, what's face is about to like shield bash Tony in the face. And like, they're all realizing Mm -hmm. that like, this is how far we've come, right? Like that was like an emotionally resonant and like, like, holy shit, like this just got real kind of moment. I think one of the best ones that I've ever scene in an animated film is uh there's a scene in baymax or yeah uh big hero big hero six big hero six where baymax is like you know uh hero hero yeah it's right yeah. hero is like pulled out yeah. like the chip that makes him like super nice and he's like i want you to kill this guy and he's like do you want me to kill him? and like he realizes that like baymax will do it because that's what he's being asked to do but he wants him to confirm that that is actually mm-hmm. what he wants him to do. And he realizes that like, oh shit. And like, I don't want, that's crazy. Like there's a moment like that. Yeah. And the way they de- depict Miguel, like when he's doing that, like cheetah run up the side of like the yeah. space elevator, like it is like, he wants to do damage. It's not just that I need to stop him. It's like, I want to kill miles and I will stop at yeah, nothing to do it. Yeah. It, it's, it's a really visually violent and being you know, a part of it's the animation style. And part of it is just like the sheer, like, I don't know, it's, you know, it's because they're on a fucking space train elevator thing and going like yeah. a million miles an hour. And he's just 
like going crazy and it's like man it is it's gnarly <laughs> It's gnarly in that scene. And it's one of those things where, like, you know, Miguel seems like he's willing to kill himself trying to kill Miles, and that comes off really, really well, and it was, you know, exciting. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree. Can I, as long as I'm sprinkling in mini criticisms that don't matter because this movie is a masterpiece, um, <laughs> they're, so they have a ton of fun in this, like, Spider HQ place showing all these different versions of Spider people. I don't even know how many comics there are in existence like are there as many comics as there are different versions of spider-man that would or spider-woman and spider-person that we see there in this universe because <laughs> it is having so much fun with all of them and i want to assume they are all based on an actual reference to something awesome amazing love that love that they get their time in the sun love getting to see them fight the movie crosses over a couple times in that universe by showing us people who are not animated at all, people who are either, uh, you know, a reference to a beloved actor or a reference to previous Sony Spider-Man films. I wish it didn't do that because in those moments I was like, don't, don't be No Way Home. Don't be Spider-Man No Way Home. I don't want you to be Spider-Man No Way Home. I don't want you to give me the exact same beat where I get to see Andrew Garfield. And, like, I, I don't want that. That was done already. And, frankly, I didn't like it very much <laughs> when it was done before. <laughs> I just, like, it's a tiny complaint because they're just little almost Easter eggs, you know, in this movie. But when it veered into showing the live action and threatened to connect this to the broader Spider-Man universe, I like, I just don't want it to. The animation is too beautiful to give me any kind of like live action. And that, that's yeah. how I feel about it. I, I think what annoys me about it is I know that that is like Sony, like just doing yeah. it because they feel they want to. I can kind of forgive it because in a world where you can be, a cartoon, a video game character, a comic book character, like 25 different types of animation. Um, everything's different frame rates. Like, why can't one of those frame rates be live action 24 frames per second, right? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it feels like it is still in keeping with, like, it feels gross, but it is in keeping with the visual aesthetics of the storytelling of what it is. Mm. Um yeah. And, you know, especially when it's in reference to scenes where it's like, hey, some form of Uncle Ben has died all these times and you get to see those times. It's kind of it, it, it feels it, it works thematically in that moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just feel like the Into the Spider-Verse did a good job of I don't know that this was explicit, but I think it was. It's like referencing those movies in an animated form, like the different Peter Parkers that we see are behaving the way those Peter Parkers did. And it's showing us like scenes from movies that were very iconic and even getting a little Spider-Man 3 joke in the mix too. Um, that is just the way I would prefer to have this done. A, just because aesthetically mixing like live action with animation i just feel like i'm watching like spongebob squarepants or something like it, it just like I don't, I don't know there's something about it that just doesn't work for me but then also showing those universes makes total sense i'm i'm fine with it and i can even get on board for them being live action because you know they're showing every other style under the sun yeah the problem is there is not only a universe that those characters exist in. There is now a multiverse that those characters exist in with already canon things that have happened in that multiverse, thanks to Spider-Man No Way Home. And I, I want this precious, awesome, amazing franchise to not be a part of that. Yeah. Um, and I know, I'm sure the studio wants it to be connected. And so they're, that is probably a studio note that they just had to do. But I just like protect this thing because it's so much fucking cooler than you know 95 percent of marvel movies yeah yeah sure it, it it is also funny to think about too like like we know that there have been, there have been so many spider-man films because if if sony doesn't make them they lose the rights to the spider-man you know i yeah it would be funny to see if there's somebody in a room that was like here's the list of all the characters we're allowed to use and the date is approaching the end let's just put them all in the movie <laughs> <laughs> like, oh yeah talk about their rights this uh, this movie just annihilated anyone's claim to <laughs> lapsing ip because um, you know it's it's not like uh 
you know, on the on the Disney side, like, uh, you know, all those different like all those other companies are like merging together and they just own the rights to everything. So you can make a movie and just fucking throw whatever you want in there because you just hold all those rights now. Um, but on yeah. this side, they're like, guys, this is our last chance. Do we want dinosaur Spider-Man <laughs> to be in, in our film? We got to do it right now. Who knows how well uh, Transformers Rise of the Beast is going to go. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> good times yeah <laughs> it's awesome let's see any any last thoughts about this film Stephen? um to me because you mentioned the bit the big big twist that miles his enemy is miles which is good to me what i loved was the way they revealed that he's in the wrong universe altogether and that is his like tearful confession to his mom that he's Spider-Man and her not getting it. And the evolution of that in my brain from, oh, this is a funny thing where she doesn't know that he's serious and she isn't getting it. Yeah. And then it's going to snap out of it in a second and it'll just be like a comedic beat to, oh, oh, no, he is not in a universe where this character exists. Chef's kiss. Brilliant. Perfectly executed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty great. Cause he... And the double the double whammy of Gwen is following him, but she isn't because she's in a different universe from the one he's in, too. Just so well done. Yeah, yeah. That is great. There, okay. You're reminding me. This is this is my one... I, don't, I have a single nitpick about this film. Mm -hmm. um, when Gwen is realizing that she needs to help Miles, right? There's like a, there's like a montage-y type scene of her just kicking the shit out of a bunch of different people, right? And, yeah. like, Miles doesn't have a watch, right? <laughs> doesn't have a watch. Uh, he had that band for a second until it got ripped off, and then now he's glitching out, right? There are just tons of times where she literally disarms the watch off of a character and then smashes the watch. I'm like, why mm -hmm. did you just keep one of the watches? <laughs> like, Miles could have used that. You have, you have the I watch. Mean when she's beating people up, she doesn't know that he is not in his universe, though. Right? Yeah. So she doesn't know he'd be glitching out. I, she I, doesn't know she has to save one. Yeah, I guess she... But, but I mean, like, if like if everybody knows where he's going because he sent himself there, like, mm -hmm. you think she would be like, hey, you know where a good place is to hide? Not in your fucking universe. <laughs> mm -mm. So, I don't know. It's just, it's just something to think about. <laughs> yeah, maybe she did pocket one and they just didn't show us. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I know even for her, well, that's the funny thing too is, she replaces hers with the one that Spider Punk makes for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so she also has a spare there that she could have given. And I'm sure, like the answer is that those things actually have tracking in them, and that's the whole reason why she needed the one from Spider Punk because then it, it's outside mm -hmm. of the world of of needing ac access to to the tracking and everything like that. But still, I mean, I feel like. The difference is they know exactly where you are anyways. Let them track you. You know, this can be a... It, it can be like a sort of uh, Battlestar Galactica uh, opening, right? Where it's like every 15 minutes they're jumping to, <laughs> to another place in the galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it would rule. Uh, speaking of Spider-Punk, A, Hobie's aesthetic. Really cool. Big fan. Hope he comes back in the third movie. I have a feeling he will. Um B, in terms of jokes that really landed on me, Miles being jealous of Gwen and her vague relationship <laughs> with this Hobie person <laughs> and wanting to know if these trips to his universe include overnights. Yeah, that was the best. Like, oh, you like stay the night or something? <laughs> <laughs> Crack me up. Yeah, that was pretty good. And I love that like all the other characters are on that same page too. And they're, they're like, yeah. oh, I can't imagine why he'd be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. <laughs> Cool. Well, yeah, I, th I think we did it, Stephen. We made it across the Spider Verse. Um, Hell yeah! Now, if only we can make it till March of next year, uh, we can follow this up. <laughs> yep. I'll, th my final thought is that this has broken a record as being the longest American studio made, at least animated film of all time. Um, at like two hours and 20 minutes i think it is uh there are there are a few japanese films that i believe are a bit longer 
Um, but if for an American studio, this is the longest. It is crazy that the longest animated movie our country has ever made is also like the most complicated in every single shot. Um, it is like th the amount of time that it must ha have taken to make this movie and then break length records by like a sizable amount. It's just fucking crazy to me. Yeah. It, it's just like maximalist on maximalist. I mean, who knows? Maybe they have like some crazy pipeline. Like, there's a lot of things where it's like you play like a 2D video game, but the game is actually a 3D game, but it's side scrolling and being rendered in 2D for the mm -hmm. presenting. I wonder if there's like weird things like that where like, you know, they connect up the style plugin that's like make this be like a Van Gogh. Oh, I'm sure, th I'm sure there's a million. I I wish I were still in academia because like SIGGRAPH this year would be crazy. Like the yeah. amount of papers that they probably have describing how they did every little thing. Um, I mean, like Pixar would have eight papers about like th like princess merida's hair and shrubbery in the background of brave like i can't even imagine what new technologies they built for this type of movie yeah it, it's got to be awesome yeah, and it, it does make you think about like you know we were just talking i don't remember if it was at the beginning of the recording or before we started recording about how long it's actually been since the previous film and it's like they're probably using zero of the pipeline from that first film like everything is probably yeah. built for, rebuilt from scratch because the old shit was not even good enough to barely handle any one individual scene in this film yeah yeah exactly the entire last movie is like you're making something in 8k and then you have a like vga um, <laughs> uh, image that you have to somehow connect to it and you're like yeah we're, we're just gonna remake it it's gonna be faster <laughs> yeah yeah or it's like finishing up uh you know, Toy Story 3 and then going back and like putting on Toy Story 1 and be like, Jesus Christ, what am I looking yeah. at? Oh, God. <laughs> that, that's my dream is one day they'll be able to just like save the camera positions and animations and just like swap the model out. Like as long as all the articulation is the same, like some way where they can just like, hey, when when we eventually make a third, fourth, fifth film, we'll just re-render <laughs> <laughs> with all new textures that first shit like i know it's not as simple as that but like i would it would be mm. great to be able to watch them as one cohesive visual experience yeah it would and i believe it is possible and i bet it will happen i think you've just called the future <laughs> sweet <laughs> all right well i think uh i think we did it so uh thank you everybody for listening and uh we will see you next time bye bye